Rachel traveling shoes. What do you say? What do you do? What if someone's going to say something to me and I don't know how to respond? Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's okay. That's what I you, you were in a You were in a better spot to stand there and to not know what to say than if you're a person who comes in with an agenda and your agenda is to go out and to broadcast your message and you take your hailer mm -hmm. I just want you all to know God hates homosexuals God hates all liars. God hates if you're rich. So don't be storing up treasures on earth, you know, where moth and rust will destroy. God hates it all. I'm serious. I'm going to come out and I'm going to give you my five-point plan. And I want you, because you're now my, you're my audience. And they stir a crowd. And it is so electric. And sometimes they will come out. And I mean, the electricity... It's only for one purpose. It's for them. And you know what? And the crowd yells at them, and sometimes they get shoved, and they get pushed, and they get kicked around. And you know what? They deserve it. Get them out. Get them out of there. And they'll think I'm suffering for the Lord the whole time. Look, I would rather have a person who has a sign, who is nervous, who doesn't know what to say, who doesn't know what to do, because you have to rely on the Holy Spirit to give yeah. you something. That's why you're in a better place. Yeah. Paul, consider what Paul said. He said, I came to you trembling. Many times Paul would pray. He, Paul would say, hey, I want you guys to pray for me that I would know what to say. Paul, why would he say that? Come on, Paul, you're the man. You wrote most of the New Testament. Why are you asking others to pray that you can have boldness to say the right stuff? Come on. But you find that you're in the best spot to be because you don't know what to say. You have to rely on God. You get someone like me, and I'm a talker. Okay? I'm, how many talkers do we have? Okay. All right. So now the problem with talkers, because I am one, the problem with talkers is we find it so easy to be able to observe and relate. And we just start talking, you know, because we're doing our thing. And we're not always turning it around. It's a problem with the talker. I am one. <laughs> Fears. The, the big question that always hits everybody, I mean, it hit our daughter at school, it's, you know, it's people come up to you and say, well, we got sickness in our family. My mom had da da, my sister yeah. had da da. I was, I, mean, I was born with this and da da da. You know, it's a, it'd be such a good God. Why, you know, and yeah. sometimes people, they get shamed by that, you know. They hear that, and 
you know, it's, it's like I'm sure I don't know. Yeah. probably feel a little weird. I get rejected the first second time too. <laughs> well, and now I've heard that many seeds, times. You know? I had a guy one time. He came. He came up to me and he said, "Well, my mother just died." So are you telling me that God killed my mother? And because at, at some point, our lives are in his hands. And, and, if, and if God didn't outright kill him, then God allowed it to happen. And if God's a God of love, then why? Mm -hmm. And again, you can fill in the blank there too. At that point, we have the opportunity to share with them one-on-one. -on -one. And what I'm sharing with that person is I'm sharing with them about fallen man, about sin. I can, I can spend all kinds of time talking with them about it if they want. And generally what I would do is I will get personal contact information because I know that for me, to, for me to adequately answer their question, I need to send them an email because it's more than just having a short conversation on the road. And people who are serious will let you do that. And so for the young man, who came to me, and I don't know if he was high or drunk or both, if he can be that way, I don't know. Because again, I was just a good kid, I didn't do any of that stuff. People have to tell me what that stuff is, because I don't know what that is. Um, the young man who came to me, he did share some information, and we, and we communicated over the next couple months. The wonderful thing about getting information from people is it's another opportunity to reach out. Because I want to be kind, I want to be courteous. You know, some of, the most, some of the most effective things in witnessing have to, happen to be truly being kind and being courteous. Someone, someone in front of you vomits and you help the other person kind of walk around it. Okay, come on. It's what you would normally want to do anyway. And they're like, thanks. And they look at you like, anyone else would just make walk through that. And you're like, come on. No, that's how we live today. Yeah. That's what goes on today. Yeah. People are so used to being walked on it's horrible. So you be kind, courteous. We want to be hands and feet, and God will provide the opportunity. From the Christian's perspective, you're leaning on the Holy Spirit. And you might have tracks, you may have a sign, but you're praying in the Holy Spirit at all times. God, what is it? Lord, draw them. And you're maintaining an observation. You're keeping your eyes right here, and you're going to watch someone, and you're going to lock on eye, eye to eye. And you'll see if someone's uncomfortable with that, and that's okay. That's all right. Be courteous. Treat people the way you would like to be treated. And when you find a little bit of courtesy, oh man, that'll open up doors. When someone comes to you with a question and you can't answer it, you can tell them, I can't answer this right now. But I would love to be in touch with you about this. And people that are serious will give you contact information. And I encourage people all the time, get it. Do a follow-up. It's another opportunity to reach out to them. If people talk, you don't have an answer, is, and it's okay to say, I don't know, you want to be real. We can't be guarded. And now all of a sudden I've stepped out of someone's comfort zone. Because it's easy for us to be guarded. Look, you as the Christian believer, I'm sorry. When you gave it up, you gave it all. And so whatever you're holding back, you've got to let go of because you step out, and the more open and the more transparent you are, that's where you want to be. That's where you need to be. Well, because people see, people see that, and they know it. If you're fake, if you're phony, or if you're the real thing. When I look at Matthew chapter 24, and I, and I read Matthew chapter 24, and I look at the end times, what do we see that's coming ahead? We see wars, rumors of wars, and all these things must come, right? But they say something very specific. They say that the love of many will grow cold. But then it tells you why. It says the love of many will grow cold because lawlessness will abound. Lawlessness. Well, they use that word. James said sin is lawlessness. Same word. Lawlessness will abound. Everybody wants to do things their way, not God's way. We're looking at a biblical worldview, but the world is looking at an individual worldview. Yeah. It's what I think it is. It's what yeah. I want to make yeah, it. It's what, and in this generation that we're trying to reach out to, this is specifically a college campus, when you're dealing with the younger kids, oh my goodness, 
I mean, the, the, the percentage of younger kids that say a homosexual marriage is just like any marriage. Two people who love each other. Come on. And that's exactly how they feel about it. And they're quite offended when people are like, but that's wrong. What, what, what is love wrong? Right? And, and things have taken this weird, skewed nature because here in the end, as things are winding up, lawlessness is abounding. So now what do we need to do? We need to do the exact opposite. When the love of many will grow cold, what do we need to do? We need to find opportunity to love more. So we have to be able to love each other and our differences. We have to reach out and love those who don't care for us, don't want us, didn't ask us to come. Look, let me ask you, did you, did you ask Christ to die for you? You know, I've had people tell me, and more so recently, I didn't ask him to die for me. This is the age that we live in. But the opportunity, the opportunity... They'll say, I didn't ask Christ to die for me. God's word has the answer to that. God demonstrated his love toward you. And that while you were a sinner, Christ died for you. He didn't ask your permission. He paid a price for you because he was already thinking of you. That's the answer. Because there was a demonstration of love that we didn't deserve. But he wanted to make it personal for you so that you can see that's how much he cares. A preacher once who would say, the meeting is the meaning. When I come to witness, I want them to see Christ. And I might not be having my most Holy Spirit-filled day, but God wants them to be saved more than I do. God wants to reach them more than I want to reach them. But somehow, he wanted to use the foolishness of preaching to reach people because you see it's not about you because you don't have all the answers and like I said that is the best place to be